Welcome to Folk Roots Radio and another live interview. I'm Jan Hall. This time around, we're going to be joined by Alec Fraser Jr., bass player, producer, engineer, and now a singer-songwriter. And as a bass player, Alec has played bass with everyone from Bo Diddley, Benny King, and the Drifters, to Jeff Healy, Jack DeKaiser, Ron Hines, and Ron Sexsmith. And as a producer, well, he's worked with some of my favorite artists, people like Rick Fines, John Brooks, and Cleela Errington, on albums that made my best of the year list. This is a guy that's, you know, fabulous producer, fabulous musician, going to be a great interview. He's also a member of a dynamic duo. That's Fraser Daly with guitarist Mike Daly. They are so tight. It is unbelievable. Great, great duo. Uh, we'll definitely be talking about them in a few minutes. And as I mentioned earlier, Alex Fraser Jr. is also a singer-songwriter. He released a great solo album, his first, on the Wings of the Wind earlier this year. And from that recording, this is Don't Cry For Me. Enjoy.
that was Alec Fraser Jr. on Folk Roots Radio with the wonderful Don't Cry For Me. And I love that video. I love just watching Chris Bartosh play the violin. That was the, yeah, uh, yeah. the violin player on there. Alec Fraser Jr. is our special guest on the show today. It's great to have you join us. Well, thank you, Jan. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris did a wonderful job on that. Uh, that and that was one of those... Uh, things during the pandemic where I had to record at my place and he had to record at his. So, but he was set up for all of that. And I always asked him, can you shoot video at the same time? So, um, <clears throat> so that, that worked out really well. I liked his enthusiasm and his dancing in the video as well. That uh, it, was all, it was all very natural. You know, and that really comes over. I, I think that the thing I love about a video like that is when you see it, it's like, well, obviously this is, you know, something that was recorded in uh, two places, but the way it moves back and forwards is quite beautiful. I mean, uh, uh, you know, his violin playing is really a big part of that song, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, I mean, I, I had originally written this song and, uh, and then once I saw it, uh, I think we pretty much both agreed that, you know, I, I, I cut him in on the writing for it because I realized like, well, half the song is violin playing and I don't play violin. So, and he had been working with me uh, on other songs as well. So I thought it was, a, it was a, a good thing that he had more of a, an interest in, in the tune as well. So uh, he liked the song a lot and he definitely added plenty to it. You know, so. So tell us a little bit about uh, the album itself. You know, one of the things I love about this recording is there are a lot of different flavors. I mean, you you cross genres in this. Uh, the title track on the wings of the wind. It sounds like Johnny Cash's come back uh, because that definitely sounds like that could have been an outtake from the uh, the unearth sessions or something like that. But um, <laughs> I, I sense that your production work, you know, probably informs your songwriting quite a bit. Um, well, in on this record, you know, believe it or not, I wasn't really trying to, uh, well, overproduce anything. I never really do. But I did take some liberties in, in the actual song, On the Winds of the Wind. I wanted to do something very cinematic, you know, sounding. And um, But most of the, for the writing part, I'd say that, well, this is an album I'd wanted to do for decades, but I just couldn't. I didn't have the time to do it because I was busy working with other people and we tend to put ourselves in the back burner, you know, but uh, with the pandemic coming along, uh, I saw an opportunity to use that time. And I, th and I wanted to make a record that, uh, that was like my tastes in music. I have very eclectic tastes. So, and I wanted to, bridge the Atlantic, like my early days in Glasgow and, and growing up there. And then what I, my influences are coming to North America, which, which was amazing uh, what I was turned on to here and, tr and kind of bring them together. Um, I could have made a blues record. That would have been the uh, smart business thing to do uh, because I'm fairly well known in, in those circles and, and, uh, uh, and that. So, but it this one had to be made first. So, and I, I, I really didn't do it to, uh, you know, to, I was mostly doing it for myself, you know, and, and, uh, I then putting it out there. So it was available for everybody. I never made any physical CDs and I knew that that was a mistake, but, um, I did it anyway. So, I may make CDs on the next one. I think I probably will just for radio uh, alone. But uh, yeah, the, it, 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 there was, there's always going to be some influence in my writing of uh, uh, the producing that I do, because it, it's very hard for me to shut that part of myself down. You know, if I'm listening to someone else playing, I'm thinking, well, that snare could have been recorded better, you know, and that kind of thing. Like, it's very hard to shut it down. So, yeah, I guess there was. Um, there, there is some influence there for that. Well, it's interesting because, you know, I love the range of the songs. You mentioned your Scottish heritage because there's, a, I think, at least one traditional on there, right? Um, yeah, there's a couple. I did, um, I did one on the Irish-Scottish one, uh, Will You Go, Lassie Go. 
Yeah. Uh, and I did that mostly because my uncle, uh, one of my uncles was, um, he had just passed away and, and, and uh, they were having the funeral over there on the Monday and on the Friday, my cousin says, oh, would you please sing his favorite song so that we can, you know, when we put him into the ground, we can, everybody can hear his favorite song. And I was just about going away for the weekend. So I recorded it really fast at eight o'clock in the morning. That video is kicking around as well. But, and uh, I did it in, in one sort of take and then I listened back to it. I said, oh, that's fine. I didn't really care too much about what I looked like at eight in the morning. But, uh, and then I left it. And uh, and I sent it to them, and they used it. So, but afterwards, I realized, you know, this is meaningful. This is a point in my my timeline that actually is is something meaningful. So, I, I sh it should be on the record. So, I, I left it on there um, for that reason. Yeah, I actually find that that really appealing because you know, basically, what we're talking about. I mean, this is your first solo album. But it, it really yeah. is the flavor you mentioned about the, the music you love. I, I, you know, we aren't able to play as many uh, songs as we would like when we're, we're talking like this. Right. But I do want to mention another song, All in a Day, which I'm trying to work out the vocals. It, it's almost like a 60 ish, um, you know, I was thinking like 68 type British vocal on that. Uh, I was thinking Stevie Winwood or something. Well, you know what? You're close on. on like I said, I've got so many influences of, of uh, and and I try. I don't try to sound like anyone in particular. Yeah. Like you mentioned, Johnny Cash, but it just comes out that way when you sing in that register, and you've got a bit of a an ex smoker's voice. Let's say right. you know, it's, there's a bit of a top end edge to the to the lowness. So it, and that's Johnny sounded like, but but in that song, all in a day. Um, I'm touching on like squeeze and uh, okay. it's got a very sort of a uh, it's got that kind of sound to it because I'm singing in it all in a day it's all up really high so yeah definitely doesn't sound like Johnny Cash no so, no well that yeah. was what I loved when I first put this on it's like wow the range <clears throat> of music you know one of the <laughs> other things I, I wanted to mention uh, if people want to to go ahead and uh, check your website out. That is alecfrazierjr.com. And one of the things I love is the fact that you have so many videos on it, uh, which is why we could start off the, with that wonderful video with, you know, you with Chris Bardosh at the beginning. One of the other songs that I love is Tolinga Night, which has Jimmy Boskill playing mandolin on. And I love the way that he just, uh, you bring him in and, you know, by the nature of you know the pandemic style video with you being yeah. in different places it really works yeah well jimmy had you know I, i've i started recording jimmy when he was 10 years old till he was about 14 and 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 uh and helped him you know along the way at, in his discovery of music as many people did and um so you know and also the thing is is that jimmy is such an intuitive player and I knew this was a song that he would probably get into. Uh, you know, it's it's very much like a Tex-Mex kind of thing. And he's got very eclectic tastes in music as well. And Terlingua Night, it's, it's funny that um, uh, when I was in the ghost town for a couple of weeks uh, with John Brooks, actually, uh, we were playing some gigs there and we played the Caraville uh, uh, Music Festival, a folk festival. And uh, being there, that song is mostly about uh, who you are when you're on the road and and how connected you are to home and, and to your loved ones. Uh, in this case, it was my dog. <laughs> I was missing my dog. I mean, I, you know, that maybe knocks it right out of the park there if anybody was thinking it was about anything else. But it really was kind of like when I'm out here uh, on my own, you know, uh, uh, on the road, which has been a lot over the last 50 years of me playing. Um, yeah, you get kind of blue and lonely and you miss, you miss your friends. You miss, you miss your dog. So <laughs> she's the sweet little senorita in the song. Cause I used to have names for her all the time. She lived to be 18 years old. So, but, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, I'm glad you picked that song. 
Yeah, it, it, it is a great song. And and again, it's I, I you know, I guess it's when people pick up a mandolin and play, it's an instrument that really draws you in. Oh, big time. And he can play. He can yeah. really play it. I mean, he I think he sleeps with his mandolin. Yeah. Um, it's it's just evident and his tone is wonderful. And he he had a way of doing it that just made the whole song. I mean, I like I said before, I I didn't want to overdo uh the production on the record. I thought, well, you know, one or two Two people is pretty much enough if it's the right person. And Jimmy happened to be the right person for that song, as I'm Chris did. Yeah, and I think you also have backing vocals from your wife, Maggie, as well, right? Um, on uh, on Terlingua Night, or no, Don't Cry, Don't Cry is Maggie okay. singing. She sort of sounds like Grace Slick on it. And yeah, no, that's what I meant on on Don't Cry for Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, goes, she walks around the house going, I sound like Grace Slick, eh? <laughs> it's like, no, because I tell her she does. Otherwise, she probably would never know. But yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and I, I, I love the way you put this together. I think you've, you've done a great job. Well, thank you very much. I had, uh, you know, I had lots of help. Though. And it was at a time where it was also, you know, we all had, there's a potential to go kind of crazy uh, during the pandemic. And this was one of the things that just kept me focused. And so it was worth doing just for that alone. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I developed my, you know, the, my circus base as well throughout this. And and take and had time to take it uh, steps further, you know. So um, that's the the uh, the upright with my drum attachment on it with seven drums. It's got seven drums on it now, so uh, that I'm playing at the same time as the bass. So I got to th throw that into some of this uh, uh, some of the album. I wanted to tease people with it uh, just a little bit. So. Well, you know, I was watching some great clips of you playing it because there's seven different drums on this. Yeah. Uh, plus the, the stand-up bass. And uh, we'll see if we'll weave uh, one of the, the clips into the, the into this video. Uh, oh, well, very good. It, it's really it's really great to, to see. Um, now, the circus bass, originally, I think also I looked at a video where you played Loch Lomond, and I think it was just the uh, snare drum, I think, at that point, right? Yeah, it's developed. I mean, it's it it started out as a little sponge. I think I've got the sponge here somewhere. But uh, it was a little sponge that I, I glued a, a drum skin onto and stuck it in the bass and started hitting it. And it's loosely based on Ernie Newton's uh, from Nashville in the fifties. He 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 was a guy that invented brush bass. Was uh, there? He's using a different tech than, technique than I am, but uh, um, but yes, he he had done this. I discovered him after the fact, but I thought, well, hey, two people can think of the same thing. But um, the uh, I have eventually added more drums to it and brought in my hands hitting different doing drum fills on the toms and that kind of thing and and also this it's a real snare with real snares in it um so and it's removable for travel and that kind of thing so i've uh, and it's electrified so i'm using a uh a, a, a drum module that gives me all the sounds that i want that i have in the studio so when i i can change the sound to a timpani if i want or or a low tom or hand claps or anything like that i don't do a lot of that but um i usually just use a basic kit and the name came from i called it the circus bass because i was always i always felt like i as it was developing that i I was always joking that I, that's it. I'm off to join the circus after this because it was such a novelty thing. No, I'm doing something that nobody in the world is doing with all of those drums and the technique that I developed. So, uh, so I just called it the circus bass for that reason. Yeah, it, it's uh, pretty cool. And I watched a video uh, of you playing it with um, Mike Daly because you play together as Fraser Daly. I th actually, I think it was. David Bowie's Suffragette, uh, Suffragette City. Oh, yeah. I love it. Uh, and you did a really cracking version of that. I was pretty impressed. Well, all of the things that Fraser Daly does is that um, it's always we're singing at the same time. We're playing the instruments at the same time. We're only ever really doing what we do. So if you come and see us live, it's going to sound just like, the well, especially the first two records we made. Uh, 
or it, actually even better because you've got the visual, you got the other senses involved. So, but um, it, yeah, with Mike and Mike and and I have uh, similar voices in the right range. So if he sings in a certain key, I it's it's in my range as well and, and vice versa we never it seemed to just connect when we were playing with jeff healy that's how we met on a new year's eve and uh we found ourselves while everybody else was off partying in the kitchen we were in the living room with two guitars going hey i know that song hey i know the song we six hours goes by and we're still playing and i thought wow we should you know maybe we should get a gig together and at that time, Jeff's uh, health was deteriorating, so it was good timing. And Jeff made a great statement when he found out that Mike Daly and I were playing together, was that he says, oh, great, my big brother's playing with my little brother. Because <laughs> he was very close to Mike, too. Yeah. So, And I was always like, his, he called me his big brother on stage at times. And I thought it was very nice of him to do that but we did become good friends during the 10-year period that i was playing with them so well i was certain i was really impressed when i you know checked out the video again i just put up the address uh fraser daily at fraser daily.com but yeah you know one of the neat things talking to someone like alec fraser jr is there's so much to talk about you know talking about uh your work as a musician and i mentioned at the start i mean you've played bass with everybody um, you know, Bo Diddley, Benny King, the Drifters in there. Yeah. Um, you know, some great Canadian performers like Ron Sexsmith, Ron Hines, and Jack. Yeah, Ron, Jack well, Ron, Ron was only uh, actually a couple of nights or whatever. I, I never really actually was in his band. When I say I play with somebody, I usually mean yeah. that. Uh, like, say, David Wilcox, I played for a couple of years with, and Jeff for many years. Um, yeah, and I got an opportunity to play with Benny King in nantucket island and i uh, and i i got uh it was uh the drifters i played with uh in toronto uh and that was a lot of fun actually because they could really sing those guys and they could dance too so uh one of them was one of the originals charlie or close to it anyway so th that was uh, there's been lots of opportunity and bo diddley it was a couple of nights uh at the alma combo um during a heat wave in the 80s um yeah I've, I've been lucky to sort of get to brush my brush with greatness and and some of my musical heroes right so that's always good uh, uh to, to have happen you know to be uh close to the people that you actually really looked up to i got that through recording as well with electrify records they kept bringing me all these great Mississippi and Chicago blues man up here, like the real, the original sort of Chicago guys, Willie Big Eyes Smith and Snooky Pryor and all these guys. And, and I get to ask them all sorts of questions about how they recorded and stuff. And, and it was almost like they were recording just like I was yeah. like live off the floor and no headphones, everybody in the same room comfortably. And, that kind of thing. So it was good. It was good to be some, somewhat validated in my choices that that I inadvertently ended up recording like them the way that they did. You know, so that's a good thing. Yeah, I do want to get into the production work now, but I do want to ask you one just a couple <coughs> more questions about Fraser Daly because I mean that is what you're doing just now. <coughs> yeah, uh, that's my main main gig. Yeah, making a bit of a name for yourselves as uh, a great house concert band, and I tell you, you know, turn up with that circus bass, and you could fill a room, no problem. Just watching you play it. Uh, yes, just, well, we do mostly private parties. That's our thing. Uh, uh bars we had kind of sort of you know there was a couple of bars we would play um and this is you know about five years ago we decided to just sort of stop uh concentrating on bars as much and concentrate more on the private parties and uh, financial reasons as well as um you know when people come they, they pay you well they they're coming there for the, the music they're not watching the game and eating chicken wings and, and that kind of thing. So uh, that, no, but there was a, there's a two really great bars that we would play. Uh, Mike and I, 
uh, and that's uh, the Intersteer in the West End on Roncesvalles. That's been our home base where we started on Wednesday nights. And uh, and Castro's and the Beaches, which has a wonderful audience. They're, they're there for the music. So we'd always come home sort of elated by the how great of a time that we had, you know, and, uh, and that's enough to continue doing the gig. Um, so like I said, yeah, we, we, that's our, that's been the Fraser daily focus. And then we made three records and, uh, and again, we didn't really send them out to anybody. We just made them available and they were, many of them were sold on the weekend. We made all our money back and that was good enough for us, you know, and they, and they exist if somebody wants to go and check them out. So, as FraserDaily.com. Yeah, well, you know, cer certainly with, with you know, your history in music, I mean, you know, we talked a bit about all of the people you've played with over the years. I mean, you know, as you mentioned, you know, people that go to house concerts go there for the music. And yeah. you, know, you have somebody, you know, with your history and all those wonderful stories, plus, uh, you know, the showmanship with uh, the instrumentation. And you and Mike are incredibly tied together. So... You know, you're looking for someone for a house concert. Fraser Daily are definitely people to consider. But let's talk about production because you talked about all of these people you played with and being in the studio playing bass um, on different projects. That must have really informed um, your ideas as you started to move from, you know, playing to engineering and producing. Uh, yeah, well, um I've always kind of had an interest, like the, one of the in, in recording, for one thing. Because uh, when we came to Canada, my father he never used to let me touch his tape machines all the time, so I uh, I wasn't allowed to. And so he wanted to soften the blow of immigrating to a country and leaving all my family and friends behind. I didn't want to come to Canada then. And uh, he says, "What can I do? I like to you know soften the blow." I said, "Okay, first of all, I want long pants." Um, I want, I, I want, so I got us, you know, in the sixties, I got these hipsters and they were, they were actually tweed and very hot. And I arrived here in the summertime, so it wasn't a good idea, but I, but, um, and the other thing I said, I want my own tape recorder. So he had, he had, a, he got me a couple, he got me a cassette deck and he got me a, a reel to reel. So I, you know, I had those and I, that was my interest in recording. I've always had that. I recorded every band I've ever been in, like bands I was in when I was, you know, 12, 13 years old. Um, but it never came to, uh, like you're saying, the bass playing part. I'm on these sessions. I'm, and, uh, you know, I'm working with different people. And uh, I, I used to joke that, uh, you know, a good bass, a lot of bass players become producers because they've got so much time in between notes to notice what everybody else is doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it's it, that was kind of fun. Boom, hey, what's that? Boom, hey, stop doing that. You know, that kind of thing. But I, I did have a lot of times to observe things and 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 work with some incredible uh, frontmen and and drummers, especially. Um, so. Yeah, it, it it has influenced me because I think in pr production, uh, especially if you're playing in a trio or you've got you know bass and drums, like the the bass and drums are a very very important part of the groove. It's what people dance to mostly, you know, and uh, and so yeah, I view that's been a a big focus in my production as well. Um, yeah, definitely. But you know, it's interesting because you know when we uh, we were talking about the interview and you know i was looking back at your production work and i mentioned at the start i mean you know three of the albums you produced in the last few years rick fine's solar powered two was yeah. up with juno unfortunately didn't win it but i think that was my second favorite album of last year clearly everington's more love and happiness yeah oh, clearly oh, underrated a really underrated album from a great artist with a fabulous voice um, yeah oh definitely you know, and then John Brooks, No One Travels Alone, which was just from a few years ago. I just listened to that the other day on vinyl because I ran into John. He goes, oh, yeah, by the way, here's the, one of my, the, the records. And the, I listened to it on my outside on my Bluetooth uh, turntable in the backyard. And I, the whole thing, I, I just thought, wow, that was really, that's really a good record. That, that record was done with, with John singing. He sang his record and finished all his basically all his parts in four hours, 
I set him up on this old creation dance hall in Hamilton somewhere and uh, with a PA pointing at him and he he did the entire record um, there and was done after four hours which is rare because many artists are you know still doing things by the end of it after you're doing overdubs and stuff so I took what he had done made sure it stood up on its own which John does he you see him solo and it is pretty incredible and his songs and his lyric lyrical sense is is like way way up there in the yeah. songwriting uh, world um and all i had to do was color it in with some bass playing and some other things and some other people that were on the record john showman was on it and and, uh, and i think that uh, if i'm right i think that that record won the npr uh, uh the top five it was right alongside with john prine and stuff and i yeah that's a big deal well, <laughs> certainly, yeah, certainly john brooks i mean every album is fun. yes and as you mentioned as a live performer he is uh, just amazing how he can hold a room just by himself oh there's no one like him yeah definitely yeah not at all it's yeah. like he's yeah uh, so i yeah the the um john and cleela uh, uh rick finds the that record solar powered 2 was done similar to the way the first one was and we recorded that outside in his gazebo and uh, there's times during the record where the cicadas and the, and the, you know the, all the other little animals and beasties uh, were joining in, like you know you could hear them. There was a couple of times where they got really loud. Now, uh, but we just decided, oh, you know what? Let's just leave them in. So, not unlike the uh, there was a record by Michelle Shocked a long time ago where she's playing by in near in alaska somewhere by the under a tree by a highway and every once in a while you heard a transport truck going by and she recorded it on sony walkman was but, that uh, from the anchorage album is that yes no. yes yeah, yeah. no I, that was a yeah she produced some great stuff yeah i think that the world should make its way on the record like many times i mean as long as it's a pleasant sound you know so yeah. um if it let it happen it's not it's it's kind of nice in a way to hear that you know so we didn't do the whole album like that but it but it did it did have its uh moments but I, I guess from a you know as a producer i mean part of your role must be you know obviously you're working with people that you you know have some knowledge of some um i i guess that the word simpatico keeps coming forward here that you know you you kind of understand where they're coming from and that really allows you to uh, you know, inform what you need to do when you you know, help color it in. Yeah, well, I don't. I I only work with people that I've seen live, that they sell me on that they can do it live. But I mean, I can make just about anybody sound great. Uh, you know, even people with no talent, and uh, and I hate that, and I haven't done that in a long, long time. Um, it's always been that I had to have some sort of connection with them. I had to like them as a person too. That was very important, but their talent needed to be able to be done live. I don't like fixing things. I, even though I can, it's just, uh, um, there's uh, the technology nowadays allows for a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, editing and fixing and stuff whereas you know when you record live off the floor a lot of times you you raise to you, you raise yourself up to the to the challenge the safety net isn't really there and uh it's a very important way to record and even though i i didn't really do that on this my own solo record well i couldn't there was nobody else around the only time i did do it was maybe on the on the solo song uh, that I, but I'm always singing and playing at the same time, which was one of the songs was um, Ocean of Emotion. That was done completely on my own. But because that's the way I'd prefer to record. I uh, Even Mike Daly and I had spoke lately about, uh, you know, this back and forth thing with, you know, doing something to a click. I do my part. I send it to you. It's not us. It's not what we do. It's not what we're known for. We're known for, as a good live uh, well, perform before. yeah and and that's what we want that's what i really want to capture on on record i mean i've done lots of records where you know you're painting your masterpiece and you're getting every single thing and everything perfect but you know, being perfect i don't know might be a little bit overrated 
yeah no well i i i love i mean what can i say i i'm having so much fun just just you know hearing you talk about you know your music and projection it's just it's fabulous and you know i mean the the art is is so clear in all of this getting back to the new album on the wings of the wind uh the first solo album do you think there'll be a second um, yes, um, in fact, I'm pretty sure that there is because I already started writing some songs for it. This one will be a different record, though, than than the one that I just did. It, it'll be a slightly more focused on on the circus bass and a lot more bluesified. Right. So I'm a big I'm a big blues fan, and it's important to be a fan of the music that you're playing. And I don't. There's a lot in the blues that I don't like, and I haven't liked the the direction it's gone, and I don't like re the recycling of uh, of things uh, just because you put your own words to it. I I want I've got some ground, you know. I want to break new ground in the genre, but I but I also want to stay true to the genre. So I've got some ideas for that, and uh, that should be what I'll be doing this winter. Oh, it's so, exciting, yeah. Because well, I'm not sure whether or not we're going to be playing very much uh, <laughs> in the next little while. Up in the air, yeah. Yes. No, that's great. Well, look, it's been fabulous to talk to you. I want to play another song before we finish. Um, another one of my favorites. I get accused of having too many favorites when I talk about an album. But it's actually the first track, Let Me Be Your Break in the Clouds. And I just, uh, I love this. Tell us a little bit about this one. Well, that one, it's funny that two of the songs that you picked are the two songs on the record, more or less, are about the, or sorry, two out of three that are actually influenced by the pandemic. And um, and the other one, Don't Cry, it was, was basically about my the strength my father had when he was told that he was not going to make it. But uh, the, the uh, Let Me Be your Break in the Clouds is is more or less like how I, I was feeling about uh, the amount of division that was happening uh, through all, all friends and all sorts of people. They were going in different directions with their beliefs. And, and I saw a lot of uh, uh, mental health going on and I saw uh, the political divide and, and, and everything. And, and I, I just thought, wow, I wish there was a way of like, like just leaving this behind, and it was more of a, a message to my wife that let's let's just stop looking at this right now and just sort of because uh, nobody really knew what was going on. It was a um, at the very beginning, but everybody spoke like they did know what was going on. So and and it was very hard to watch. It became draining after a while. Yeah. So I wanted to. I, I took the other route. I always go to the comedy side of things. Or not that the song is kind of comedic, but in real life, you know, I, I definitely uh, went in the direction of uh, having more fun uh, with the time that I had rather than uh, talking about things I didn't really know about. Mm -hmm. So, and the new, the, the media at the same time were very, the heads keep talking, you know, that kind of, uh, that line is, is, I found that very draining. I, I almost got to the point where I couldn't even watch television anymore until I rejuvenated. So, so I wanted this. I wanted that to be a, um, a sort of a, a therapeutic song for me to write. That's what it was. So it's a great way to finish. This yeah, right. Alec Fraser Jr. with "Let Me Be Your Break in the Clouds" from the wonderful album "On the Wings of the Wind," and Alec. It's been a great pleasure talking to you today. I probably should just ring you up in a few months and say, okay, what have you produced this year? Which one is going to make it into my best of the year list? Because well, I, did, I just your production. I've done, I've done a couple, so they'll be coming at you. I'm yeah. sure. And you can call me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a lot, Jana. I really, uh, I really appreciate it. Jana It's like a, uh, enjoyable interview. Alec Fraser Jr. On Folk Roots Radio. Thanks again. I dream in colors of sisters 
brothers Then I look outside at the black and the white A bright day may seem so Bright.